commission's decision. We advise that you seek your own independent legal advice to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. We need a motion to comply with the governor's executive order 16 regarding electronic meetings. The items on the agenda constitute essential business of this body and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Is there a motion to approve that? So moved. Sarah Lee, is there a second? Second. second. All right, second. So thank you, Mr. Gillian. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Williams. Nora Carter. Aye. Sally Woods. Aye. Bella Brown. Aye. Michael Gillian. Aye. Okay, is there anyone I'm missing? Uh, do you have O'Connell as I? Okay, thank you, Freddie. I missed your list name on the list. Thank you. That's been approved. Okay, all right. Uh, is there a motion to approve today's agenda? So moved, Commissioner Woods. Woods. Okay, is there a second, please? O'Connell seconds. O'Connell second. All in favor, Ms. Williams, Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Commissioner Gillian. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. Okay. Approval of the minutes of the January 11th, 2021 meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Okay, we have a first from Sarah Lee. Is there a second? Uh, second. Okay. Mr. Commissioner Kern. White. All in favor? Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Commissioner Gillian. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Okay. Aye. All right. Before I introduce Faye DeMazi, DeMazimo, I want to first of all say welcome back, uh, Commissioner Williams. We missed you last meeting. We know why. We hope that you are well. And please know that we have all been thinking of you every day since Christmas. Thank you very much. I appreciate that more than you will ever know. So, all right. Ms. DeMazimo, and my apologies for any mispronunciation, welcome to our meeting. I understand you have a uh, update on the mayor's uh, transportation plan. I do, sir, and a couple of other related matters. And I'll tell you what, you can just call me Faye. It's a heck of a lot easier than the rest of us. <laughs> that so, is easier. Thank so you. Phil, I've, been, I've been here over a year now, so I feel like we all know each other well enough. You can just call me Faye. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you all today and to provide a, a transportation update. Um, we have several things to talk about. And as a matter of fact, there's some things that have come to mind that I want to be sure I mention that may not be in our slide deck particularly, but I do want to make sure I mention them. So I don't know who's, Chip, are you controlling the slides? No, ma'am, it's Corby. Okay, Corby, can you go to the next one for me, please? Next slide. So recent successes, um, of course, the transportation plan adoption was um, a monumental step in sort of setting the path forward of, of how we're going to um, how we're going to engage in the business of, of transportation here in Metro Nashville. And I think the thing that is most promising to me about the transportation plan is not just the the vision that was put forth, the right size plan, as the mayor would call it. Um, but but the, it really is moving us in the direction of a people first transportation plan where we are thinking first about how are we moving people, not how are we moving vehicles. So it really, uh, the emphasis um, in the vision zero component of it and the safety component of it um, is around how are we moving pedestrians? How are we also incorporating things like scooters and bikes? 
How are we making sure that we're handling loading and unloading? So there's so many uh, different facets in the transportation plan, different projects in the transportation plan and buckets of investment that will enable us to make sure that all of the transportation needs and particularly how we improve safety and especially safety for the most vulnerable users, our, our pedestrians and our cyclists are fully incorporated in this. So we're very proud about the transportation plan adoption. Hope I know we've presented it to you in the past, but I'd reiterate that I hope you have a chance to come go to the website and take a chance to look through that, that final adopted uh, plan of where we're moving. So one of the first things that came out of that less than a month after its adoption was there was a grant application that we submitted before the plan was adopted. Um, and frankly, didn't think that we had a whole lot of shot at it because we didn't have an adopted plan. But one of the things that we did is through our relationships with uh, the federal partners and the state partners um, in this regard, we kept talking about the progress and the efforts that we were making around the transportation plan and assurances that we felt like a transportation plan was forthcoming and that as a part of that transportation plan was looking at how we could best incorporate traffic technology as a part of this overall traffic management, improving safety. And this particular uh, award is really directed at not only traffic management technology, but particularly the management of transit traffic um, in the, um, the Charlotte Avenue MLK corridor. We had a corridor that's included in the transportation plan called the innovation corridor there. Um, this is a component of that. This was a, you know, we've talked about how we were going to make this transportation plan work in the absence of dedicated funding. And we had, we had expressed a, a expectation that we felt like for the, the commitments that are, are being made through the capital spending plan, um, that overall over the course of this plan, we could leverage uh, a 40% investment of local funds to 60% from partners, 30% approximately state, 30% federal on this particular project. Um, this is this is a, a complete success story around that that uh, approach that we're taking because uh, about um, uh, so this is a three million dollar project a million and a half of that three million is coming from our federal partners and uh, a million is coming from our state partner and then five hundred thousand from Metro Nashville so a, a great leveraging great partnership to achieve what we believe will be some substantial improvements around the operations uh, and improvements of safety in that corridor, traffic management, but particularly um, improving the reliability and the operation of the transit uh, route in that corridor. Next slide. So other activities that are coming up, um, we've started the cord pilot on, on loading and unloading in the downtown area. I know that uh, Derek is on the line, Derek Haggerty, and if we have some particular questions about that, he's really the boots on the ground for the cord pilot, but again, very exciting, and we've been getting a, a great amount of national press um, around our, our being one of those three selected communities from last year to participate in that. The Vision Zero project, arguably the most important project in the entire transportation plan, how we begin to uh, reframe our safety of our of our infrastructure in Metro Nashville. That action plan component of that, as you know, the mayor committed to us becoming a Vision Zero, a zero fatalities city uh, last year, and then we um, started on the development of the action plan. That is beginning now, um, and we will be bringing forward progress updates on that to you as they occur, but very exciting um, effort there. One of the things I would uh, also point out on that sort of a late breaking news piece is last weekend, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, we participated as many of the council members did um, and many members of the community in a commemoration of uh, remembrance for the pedestrians who lost their lives, 39 um, up from the previous year um, in Metro Nashville. Um, and one of the, the things that was done in, as a part of Walk Bike Nashville's hosting of that event was they released a report around seven key corridors in Metro Nashville that, that see the highest rate of those um, pedestrian fatalities and some of the things that they uh, identified as causal factors. One of those was lighting. Um, over this past week, Public Works has done a tremendous job. Um, Devin Doyle, I see, is on the line as well, and Devin has been working closely with um, NES as our partner 
and we have 18 lighting improvements at those locations that are underway now. We're coordinating with TDOT on the permitting that's needed to um, implement some of those, but these guys have been out in the field for a solid week, making sure that those kinds of things that are um, that we can make happen and make happen quickly to improve those conditions are, are ongoing. So that's an exciting thing. We also um, know that one of the things that we wanna do, um, especially leading up to the consideration of a Department of Transportation is to improve our overall um, management of our program. We can always, even in a, in a good organization, we can always look for ways to improve um, one of the things we spent last year doing was developing the construction management manual for um, uh, the, the public works slash DOT. Um, we are now engaged in developing the companion manual to that, the pre-construction manual. Um, and we, we that is going to be a great business tool to measure to, or to, to manage ourselves to outcomes more efficiently, more effectively. Um, and use it as a training tool for both our staff and for the consultants and contractors that work with us so that we can improve the schedule of delivery and the cost effectiveness of delivery of all kinds of projects. But I think sidewalks is certainly one we've really been focused on. Utility coordination, um, I mentioned NES, but we've been working on a, a new utility coordination process that just builds upon some of the success of previous years. Um, Hal over at uh, Metro uh, Water has really been helping to lead that for us. And we've got two different groups that meet regularly now, meet on a regular schedule. One is a, a group, a sort of utility coordination policy, and that's really the management sort of executive level around things like cost sharing and how we undertake utility coordination at that policy level. And then a group that meets regularly now that looks at the, every project level and improves upon the utility coordination um, that we have, not only with NES, but with all the other major utility um, utilities that we work with in Metro Nashville. The grants opportunities forecast, um, we mentioned that ATC MTD grant that we were very successful with. Um, we, again, we had a great project and they had a belief in us because we did have a transportation plan so uh, deeply underway that we were successful. But we've got uh, a couple of other opportunities that we've already identified coming up that we hope that we can be as favorably situated for. One, we applied for just in the last month um, and uh, it would be for the downtown neighborhood traffic project. Um, that application went into TDOT um, and we have, uh, if we're successful with that project, we've got it sort of ready to go. If for some reason the TDOT funding on that one doesn't come through, it's a partnership project with a substantial amount of the funding uh, coming from both WeGo as well as from the downtown partnership. Um, and we will still be able to undertake, we'll just rescope that project slightly to get it underway, a very important uh, effort that's described in the transportation plan. The, um, in April will be a, a funding opportunity called CMAC, um, Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Funding that's awarded through TDOT and the um, MPO that we will be working with to, um, that potentially could be 100% funding opportunity for us to build out our traffic management center. Um, which would be the nerve center for all of the traffic ma management system improvements, the signal modernization, signal system modernization, and all that that we, um, smart signals that we hope to undertake over this coming year. Um, so we've got a really strong grant opportunities forecast. And then of course, um, you, I'm sure that uh, you also follow the conversations that are going on now with the new administration um, and the new secretary of transportation. Um, there's a great interest in a much stronger um, infrastructure funding um, than we've had for, for a bit. And so um, that we're looking forward to those opportunities um, as well as things that are bubbling out there on the horizon. You probably have heard about Amtrak's uh, consideration of where the cities that they want to connect with new service, passenger service in the coming years. And, and of course, Nashville's on their radar screen. The DOT recommendation is uh, moving forward. Um, we are um, completing the assessment uh, that has been underway now for some months of all of our existing processes and so forth. And so that, that will um, be um, uh, coming forward in the next uh, month or so, a few weeks. Next slide. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit. Um, I know that we've been to you before and talked to you. And we want to go into some depth on this one today, the smart parking RFP. Um, Colleen um, Herndon from ITS has been the project manager for this and has just done the most remarkable job. Um, I want to just go through some of the um, these pieces of it and then give you a chance to ask us questions um, and, and make sure that we that you are feel very familiar with what, what we're doing. So the scope of this is for Metro owned on street parking and the RFP is driven by performance objectives. If you reflect back to RFPs that you've heard about from previous years, this is not that RFP doesn't share any of the same uh, focuses. Um, we are retaining the assets. We are um, we're, we're not selling anything off or giving anything away. Um, but we are trying to make sure that we are managing what we have to better advantage, particularly financial advantage of Metro Nashville. So this RFP is driven by performance objectives and we've allowed enough flexibility in that though to so that innovative responses by the, the uh, vendors uh, are encouraged. We're focusing on customer service, operational ex excellence and technology and data to drive efficiencies. Um, and it, it will be a performance based contract with um, operations and management and enforcement all considered under that, but not collections. One of the things we did in developing this RFP is we sought the expertise of other communities, not only uh, in the in America, although most of them were, but but one peer in the UK that have really done some exceptional work in this area, and that included Columbus, Ohio, Louisville, Kentucky, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Austin, Texas, and then Newcastle in the UK. Um, and we got some really, especially um, I think on the financial side, some really um, great input from peer cities that have already been there, done some of this and understand both the things that worked well, the things that didn't work well. And they gave us some great insight uh, into how to move forward. Next slide. So I've already described the peer review process. I already assured that Metro will retain all asset ownership and Public Works will retain all oversight and the TPC will retain all policy control. We've got a proposed bill that will be submitted for the February 16th council meeting agenda that includes updated definitions to parking meter, meter zones, payment options, and allows for contractors under Public Works oversight to participate in enforcement activities and allows for paid parking on Sundays per approval from the TPC. Next slide. The smart parking RFP publication will be a multi round solicitation with responses from round one to inform round two. And then we are also as a part of this, this is all so we've talked about the cord loading and unloading uh, digital curbside infrastructure management piece. We've talked about the smart parking RFP. We also realize that we need a Metro wide. This would include both central business district as well as residential, a comprehensive operational assessment of parking. Um, and that would include not just an inventory of assets, but uh, looking at the operational um, uh, values of all of those of all of those uh, parking metrics throughout Metro Nashville and all of those things together would come into would be, become a part of the development of the curbside management strategy later in the year um, that we hope to start up um, late, later this year. So with that, um, I'm going to move over to the next slide, which is for questions. And again, uh, Colleen Herndon, who's been the project manager for the Smart Parking RFP, is ready for any detailed questions there. And then uh, Derek Haggerty is working on the CORD pilot and can answer any specific questions there. And I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today and to hopefully, um, hopefully, you, hopefully you feel as good as we do about the progress that we're making. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Any questions from commissioners, please? Fred, Mr. O'Connell and then Commissioner Kern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll start um, with just, I guess, a couple of basic ones about um, the uh, parking RFP. Uh, so we had obviously very robust discussion that reached um, this commission back a couple of years ago uh, about a parking modernization RFP. And I know we have, you know, I think the cord piece and being a, a competitive process and being selected as one, uh, one thing. I know when I joined this commission, part of my 
um, interest was in seeing what we could optimize, basically what we could take away from the previous parking modernization discussion uh, and see how we could accelerate um, you know, some of the necessary infrastructure. Like uh, I, I have heard that we were on the verge of actually updating some of our existing uh, meter technology, uh, meter equipment, uh, and then kind of that initiative lost momentum because we began as a city to pursue a, a parking modernization approach. I guess my biggest question is how is this different uh, from the approach a couple of years back? Well, I think we, if we could go back a few slides, I think that that answers that question. Let's, I don't know who's running the slide thing again. If you can go back about four slides, I think for me. Uh, here we go. Let's see. Uh, let's flip one. Up. Keep going. Go back one more. Okay, go forward one more then. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Yep. Back one. Sorry, guys. Um, so um, the previous uh, RFP uh, proposed selling the assets. This we would not be. We are retaining all asset ownership. We are retaining all oversight, and we're retaining policy control. Um, in the in the. I think the the other part that you're talking about, Councilmember O'Connor, where there was just a, a modernization of equipment, this is a a more, I think a more comprehensive and a more strategic approach. We sort of went from something that that put everything out in the market, and then we went back to something that all it did was modernize the equipment, and now we're we're to something that says, okay, how can we bring these things together in a way that we maximize our um our ownership uh of the assets how can we maximize that in terms of the operations and management of it and also modernize the infrastructure so i think that where we are now is a blend between several previous initiatives that have related to about the length of time anticipated by the, the RFP, um, who is actually making the capital investments. And I guess I'm not suggesting that there was actually a transition to some approach that would have only modernized equipment. I just, I was looking at, you know, and I, I know I discussed this with the uh, chair when I was uh, joining the commission and we were kind of going through, um, you know, the aftermath of that previous RFP uh, looking at the opportunities that the commission might have, you know, knowing that there had been a lot of criticism of that previous RFP process. Okay, what can the public side, what can this commission do to, to spearhead some of this, um, you know, the, the sort of the best and maybe also the easiest pieces of the parking modernization process. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I'll need to see some of the details of the proposal. Colleen, do you want to uh, contribute a bit to that conversation too? Because I know you've really been in on the, the details of the discussion between the differences from before and now, and, and particularly to some of the uh, things that Councilmember O'Connell is, is most keenly interested in. Yes, happy to do that. So just to confirm you're correct, it was a 30 year is what was proposed the last time. And one of the lessons learned from that is that there were, as you mentioned, concerns over the length of time for that contract. So what we're proposing with this RFP is a five year contract. In round one, though, we are asking the potential offers to give us feedback on, you know, if it was something that they were going to be providing the capital investment for, which is still up for discussion based on the responses if that would be a long enough period of time to to pay back that capital. So um, in the RFP, it states that we're 
just wanting to get feedback from them, but we're not even contemplating going over 10 years at this point in time for the, the length of the contract. And council member, that was also based on input from those peer review cities that have some very successful smart parking um, infrastructures in place now um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, okay, that's that's helpful. I, to, Colleen, to make sure I understand this, we're we're anticipating though that the arrangement would be relatively similar, where a third party would generally make the capital investment. We're time boxing it in a much tighter time frame though. Actually, no, we're at this point, we're open to both. So when we were originally starting to draft this RFP, our thought was, yes, we would want this contractor to provide that upfront capital. But after getting the feedback from the peer reviewers, they, they brought up some excellent reasons as to why that might not be in the best interest of Metro. And so we, at this point in time, our plan for the second round of the solicitation is to ask for them to provide financial proposals for both of those situations. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Commissioner Kern, you had a question and then Commissioner Woods. Yeah, I think that was um, much of my question was around the capital investment, which was seemed to be the hardest challenge last time around. Um, I was curious with these policy changes around meter zones and, and definitions, um, when we might expect to be able to see those um, for the commission or if you have or when the details might be available to us. Colleen, do you have that information? Um, we have actually submitted the details of that to council to be placed onto the February 16th council meeting agenda. So after this meeting, I'm, I, I believe I can email those out. Is that correct? At this point, I to go ahead and share them with you. I think that, I think that's correct. Okay, so I'm happy to do that. Yes, that'd be great. And one other distinction between in terms of the lessons learned and to your point about the, the change in the, the capital, the difference with that is with this RFP, we're not asking the contractors to pay Metro and any upfront you know, capital, any cost like last time was in exchange for ownership of those assets. So would the costs would metro still make a percentage of the revenue of the meters and would the private companies also make a percentage of the revenue so that is also something that we've discussed quite a bit that we're leaving open right now um at this point you know some of the talk has been well would it would it make sense would it incentivize these contractors to operate as efficiently as possible if they were getting a percentage of the revenue um, that's still something that is up for discussion based on the feedback that we get from round one um, one thing that we have discussed and decided on is that that would not include any of the revenue from citations which i believe is different a little bit different from last time there was a concern that last time the the contractor that came in was actually going to be incentivized for writing more tickets and collecting more money on the citations where this time it's really more focused on compliance um, and not giving any sort of an incentive by sharing revenue for citations but in terms of the parking meter revenue specifically, that's something that we're waiting to get feedback from round one to, to help inform. And again, Nora, that was based upon some lessons learned from some of those peer review CDs that we mentioned um, that was just really informative to us about things that we thought would be good approaches and good ideas. They went, yeah, we thought that too until and then we learn some things and we read. That's why we're, especially in this first round, we're seeking information that will help inform us for, for subsequent rounds and make sure that we shape a situation that is most advantageous to Metro Nashville. Um, is that okay if I go now, John? Uh, my question is, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the information. As someone who, like some of the other commissioners, we were on the receiving end about how very unpopular 
the previous proposal was with the community. Uh, all of us heard a lot. I see one thing under the proposed bill for February 16th council meeting, Faye, that says allows for paid parking on Sundays. Uh, are you talking like metered parking around churches where people are used, are used to not paying, charging people? Colleen, did you want to address that? Absolutely. So in the proposal, it's just to have the uh, for it to have the option for paid parking on Sundays. But ultimately, we would then come and have that discussion with with you all as a committee to approve any any hours before those are put into place. So it's just, I guess, allowing us to have that further conversation. It permits the flexibility for it, but doesn't require it or or eliminate it at this point which is what we're trying to do is we're trying to to keep as many options open so that once we get we get down to selection and really application of this we we can really tailor and customize to what we all want and need at that point but that's a very good point uh and we appreciate you bringing that up <laughs> thank you Are there any other questions or comments? Anything on any of the other parts of it besides the smart parking? Councilmember O'Connell, you've got a hand up, but I don't know if it's still a hand up from before or now. No, I was just gonna kind of close the loop on this. I guess um, thinking, thinking through all of the um, items that went through, I, I, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding where the uh, the revenue sharing piece is going to be. I think last time we looked at this, um, a proposal like this, the the private vendor would have been guaranteed a certain amount of revenue. Um, and then looking at where we are right now in a timing sense, are we, are we expecting that this proposal will have uh, an FY22 impact and is it a predictably budgeted impact? I don't think we have enough information yet to give a predictable budgeted impact, council member. Um, we will after we get, get some information from the vendors. Colleen, I don't know if you had any further thoughts on that or not. I, I agree that I think it's a little bit too early for us to be able to answer that question. One thing that that I do know is that we have written into the RFP to if, if the vendor were to provide that initial upfront capital, that Metro would still be receiving as priority the revenue that we're receiving today. And that was mentioned that that was one of the concerns with the last time. But I think that until we get through round one and we really know who is is providing that that upfront capital, um, it's a little, I don't know the, don't have that information just yet. Okay. I think, I think it's, I think it's really critical. Round one is gonna be really cr critical to us, really understanding the current market, understanding the current vendors that are interested in us, getting the, it's, it really is getting a whole lot of information in that's really gonna allow us to shape the deal, if you will, that is most advantageous to us, both on the, on the infrastructure and on the operations and management side and be able to bring recommendations back um, to this group and to council um, with regard to how to move forward. But that this first phase is going to be critical to that. Right. I guess what I'm getting at is we we came into office, anybody who was elected in August of 2019 uh, with part of our um, the fiscal hold that resulted in a corrective action plan with the comptroller being specifically anchored around this parking modernization proposal. So what I'm trying to understand and anticipate is, do we expect the revenue piece of FY22 to include revenue specifically tied to this proposal? I think it could, but I don't think we know enough yet to be able to tell you anything much more specific than that about it. But yes, I think it could. Okay, thank you. And, and, and probably will, but 
Right. We, need to get, we need to get a little further through this first phase of the process. Um, and then I think we can give you, uh, by the time we come back to you after that first phase to give another report, we can give you a much more certain and specific answer to that, I think, Council Member. Okay. All right. Thank you. Are there any other commissioners with questions? All right. So, Faye, the only question, uh, I, I've got a question and then a follow-up, is to me one of the biggest criticisms of the last process was the lack of public input. And in all the literature that I've read about what other cities have done is the most successful programs involve input from citizens before an RFP was submitted. I know you did these meetings around town and I know we've been in the middle of a pandemic for nearly a year. So what's the public input phase of this project, please? I think the public input phase of this will come a little later. And I actually think it's more appropriately placed there for this reason. Um, you know, when we the, the smart parking RFP is really focused much on our hardware and our the state of our hardware and our technology, not something that just everybody would would have a, a, a particular perspective or, um, or, or, or a particular uh, opinion about per se, um, other than the fact that um, we do know that, and we did talk about this with some of the other peer review cities, how equity plays into this and how we need to be able to ensure that whatever um, parking infrastructure we um, improve to is still parking infrastructure that enables anyone to be able to use it and to use it easily and so forth. Even while we're modernizing, we're still um, allowing for those who need to pay, for example, with coins or whatever. So, um, so I think there's that piece of it. I think on the management piece of it, I, we will be doing public outreach and public involvement around that. Um, and I think it needs to come when we have something to, to talk about what are even the, what is the array of options at this point. So I would suggest to you that it's better placed in this particular case, not just because of the circumstances and the difficulty in getting input right now in a, in a way that people can feel like they're really you know, able to to tune in, but I think it's I think it's the notion of we need to have a little bit a little something more with a little more meat on the bone and a little more description to it with options in that to be able to say here's what we're trying to accomplish. What do you think? Um, so I think that that's an important part of this rather than taking something, especially when all we're really focused on with this particular RFP is modernizing the infrastructure itself and then figuring out how do you best operate and manage that modernized infrastructure. It's it's not the, I think the, the part where it's really gonna be important to start with the public input as you're describing, um, Mr. Green, and I think this is really important, is that work we talked about that comes a little later in the year around metro-wide parking, including our residential areas, parking operational analysis and curbside infrastructure management plan there's no doubt about it that that needs to start day one because that's a that's a much more uh, it's not a technology driven or sort of a you know boots on the ground operations and management driven piece per se. That's really much more about the parking policy for all of Metro and all of its facets of parking uh, that must be driven by a community, not by just the those underlying other things. Okay. If that makes sense. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. So we'll look forward to uh, getting updates as we progress along with this process and uh, being a partner in implementation. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate your time and letting us be on the agenda today. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let's try to move along because we have a long agenda uh, or we have some things uh, to do. Okay. Um. The next item is to approve the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda has three items. The first is to authorize a speed limit reduction on Cheyenne Boulevard from Neely's Bend to Bubbling Wells Road from 40 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour. Uh, item B is authorize a traffic signal at Armory Drive and Sidco Drive requested by NV5. And item C is to authorize a truck restriction on West Hillwood Drive from Charlotte Pike 
the Hillwood Boulevard requested by a resident. Um, are there any items that people want to remove or dis discuss? If not, I'll look for approval of the consent agenda. Move to approve the Commissioner Woods. Commissioner Woods has moved to approve. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Kern. Kern, okay. All in favor, Commissioner Williams. Aye. Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Gillian. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. Okay. The consent agenda has been approved. The next item on the agenda is uh, authorize a valet zone at 500 Broadway requested by Premier Parking. Miss Marshall, do you have insight on this request, please? Hello? Mr. Chair, she might have dropped off. I'll give okay. her a call. All right. Um, yeah. How about item C? Okay. Okay. We'll go to item C. An ordinance to amend section 12.36.110, the Metropolitan Code pertaining to weight restrictions on certain roads. Council member Rosenberg is here to discuss this. Is that correct? Along with I, Mr. Haggerty. I am Mr. Chair, this is Dave Rosenberg. Okay, thank you council member, if you'd proceed. Uh, thank you. Um, so this is a piece of legislation to restrict trucks on three stretches of road in the outer reaches of Bellevue. Um, it's a little different from a standard weight restriction in that it seeks to limit not just through traffic, but also excessive local traffic. Uh, McCrory Lane, Poplar Creek, and this stretch of Old Harding are alternately narrow, windy, hilly, and highly residential. And we've had issues with them uh, then using residential subdivisions to access unpermitted projects over which Metro had no authority. Um, I can talk about individual incidents that have occurred, but, but those are in some ways, I guess, beside the point. Um, each of these proposed routes has an alternative US or state highway that can instead be used, uh, mainly US 70 South, uh, US 70, Highway 100 and 251, which is four lane Old Hickory. Uh, they all provide adequate use uh, and access for heavy traffic. Um, so this is intended really to stop gross violation of the integrity of these roads and any enforcement when it comes to the idea of excessive trips within these um, corridors would need to come from residents documenting such violation. Um, that's the case with much bar enforcement. Um, as far as the wording of the legislation itself, I'd like to ask for your consideration of this legislation with an amendment uh, that replaces the word occasionally, uh, as recommended by Ms. Costonis when this commission considered a non-legislative version of this uh, a couple months ago. Um, uh, if you recall, in addition to that concern, it became clear that the standard weight restriction could not accomplish what we're looking to do here. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm glad to describe the language that I'd like to suggest, um, subject to the commission's thoughts or alterations, or I can wait to do that at your convenience. Um, but at any rate, I, I'd appreciate your consideration so that impacted residents uh, can get a little peace of mind and, and safety at, at no real cost to anyone. Okay, thank you, council member. Uh, thank you. Mr. Haggerty, did you have insight from Metro Public Works concerning this matter? Yes, uh, Derek Haggerty, Nashville Public Works engineer. Uh, before you see the language, um, yeah, it sounds like we're gonna discuss this a little f further going forward. The existing language essentially allows uh, the Traffic and Parking Commission to restrict any vehicles 
except for those actively delivering or picking up materials or merchandise. This new amendment language, um, which would obviously not fall under that existing language, but amend the existing code, uh, essentially limits vehicles with a gross weight of over 31,500 pounds on those three certain roads from occasional deliveries. Um, you know, I, I think we would like to see a little more uh, clear language on what is meant by occasional. I think that's a discussion we absolutely need to have just as far as educating the public, uh, businesses, and helping out enforcement. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at this, just from an engineering standpoint, um, put together an analysis. I believe commissioners have a copy of that, looking at pavement conditions and cross sections, street classifications, local state and federal regulations and crash history. Um, based on those factors, we do not recommend weight restrictions on these streets. Uh, pavement is in good condition. Streets are either classified as collectors or arterials. Uh, local, state, federal regulations, you know, all are pretty much in a line with 80,000 pounds as the maximum allowable weight. The cross section on all three streets is the highest level we have here in Metro Nashville, so more than up to the task. Uh, looking at crash history also, we just went back, I think about 20 months, um, and really didn't see uh, any major contributions from these oversized vehicles, uh, and that's all in the report. Happy to answer any questions uh, that the commission may have. Commissioners, any questions? So, member, what are you, there's something specifically you're asking us to do, my, and my apologies if I missed that during your first explanation. Sure, um, well, I, would, I would say that, you know, this is a, and I appreciate, I appreciate Mr. Haggerty, um, this is really more quality of life than pavement condition. I don't know if the crash history um, that uh, Mr. Haggerty was able to pull up only looked at Poplar Creek, McCrory, and uh, old heart of themselves versus the side streets that uh, this is mainly or in large part seeking to protect. Um, we had just a few months ago, a large dump truck slam into the side of someone's house um, and, and one of the neighborhoods off Poplar Creek there. Um, and, and there have been some other incidents as well. Another truck that went down an embankment uh, off McCrory there into uh, what at the time was a neighborhood under construction and it's now fully built out. Um, so what, what I, you know, the occasional is an issue. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, suggest that we change the language uh, so that it says, no trucks over 31,500 pounds, except that such vehicles may be operated thereon for the purpose of the delivery and pickup of materials and merchandise at residences and businesses, provided such vehicles make no more than 18 such trips to any such residence or business per week, and for the delivery and building materials for buildings under construction for which a building permit has been obtained. So for that second part, those last three lines that are highlighted there on your screen, we would just take out the word occasional. If you're permitted, then uh, if you're a permitted building under construction, then you'd not be impacted at all. Uh, it would look instead to limit to 18, which is six, you know, three times uh, a day, six days a week uh, for the delivery of uh, and pickup of materials and merchandises, merchandise at residences and businesses. Um, on this particular stretch, there are a few businesses on Old Harding uh, Pike there. They're all, none is a big box store or something that gets many, many deliveries per day. Um, and Poplar Creek and the roads off of it and McCrory Lane do not have any uh, commercial businesses besides a twice daily that also uh, wouldn't be impacted. Councilman, uh, Michael Gilliland with a question. On McCroy Lane, there is a a rock business 
um, they could incur some heavy loaded vehicles. Has anyone talked to that business owner? Do you know you know which one I'm talking about? You know, uh, right across from Avondale Park. Yes, sir. Yes, I need to. I spoke with him not about this specifically, but had another conversation with him regarding the amount of. As part of a conversation about him talking about wanting to rezone some nearby property about the amount of traffic that he uh, yields. And I need to pull that up to find out specifically what he said about the uh, his current truck traffic. Um, sorry, I don't have that in front of me right now, but I'll work on getting that up by the end of this conversation. Mr. Chair, I have a few questions. Yes, ask away, please. Uh, thank you. Um, for, I guess first to Mr. Haggerty, are we, um, I, it wasn't clear to me, is, is staff recommending one way or the other on approval of this? Sorry, Derek Haggerty, Public Works. Uh, we are, you know, just based on engineering standpoint, uh, not recommending approval. Okay, and then um, uh, next question is Ms. Costonas. Um, I think last time there had been some discussion about, I think in a related way to public works, um, a departmental skepticism of this, some legal concerns. Is, is Council Member Rosenberg's amendment um, resolved those legal concerns or would you say there are still some legal concerns here? Um, as to the use of the term occasional, um, I think the concern that Mr. Haggerty mentioned previously in terms of enforcement, it certainly would be something that would be vague and that um, uh, if we were to take enforcement action against a violator, um, that violator or, or their attorney um, uh, could um, push back on on the grounds that that you know it was unclear you know, what occasional actually meant. So the amendment that is being proposed, um, it would be an improvement um, in terms of increased specificity um, and um, ability to um, uh, understand um, both um, in terms of um, on the front end, you kind of notice of what's required and on the back end in terms of the, the um, enforcement perspective, um, uh, you know, it, it gives more clarity. Um, uh, in terms of other, other legal concerns, I mean, certainly I think that the concerns are that, um, you know, sort of the, the concerns that we generally have um, with regard to um, uh, matters that the commission considers, um, uh, you know, um, ensuring that we're not being arbitrary and capricious, ensuring that there is, um, uh, more than a scintilla of evidence for um, uh, the decision made by the commission. In this case, this is a, a, a council um, bill that is a mandatory referral to this commission for the charter. Um, so um, the commission's role is to um, uh, either recommend it um, or if they don't recommend it, um, if, they dis dis if they, I guess, give it a, a negative recommendation, then um, the council would still be able to pass it, but they would have to um, have a two thirds majority to override that disapproval. Um, and then if the commission does not act on it within 30 days of referral, um, then the council can vote on it by a simple majority. Okay. Um, Ms. Costones, um, the question that I have is this ordinance, the existing ordinance is kind of broad. Basically, my understanding is it gives this commission the authority to change truck weight limits on different streets, whereas the proposed language Yes, does it still give us that? Looks like this is very specific to three to some particular streets, which is concerning to me that the language is that narrowed. Hello? Oh, 
I'm sorry, was I muted? Can you hear me? Yes, now okay. I can. So this is different. Um, the, um, the process that the commission normally goes through when it um, considers um, a, a truck weight restriction um, is pursuant to existing language in the Metro Code in the section that would be amended by this proposed bill, um, 1236.110. Um, so normally um, when just the commission by itself um, issues a weight restriction, then it would be subject to that language that you can see on your screen on the um, uh, the left-hand column where it's highlighted, except that such vehicles may stand or be parked there on actively to deliver or pick up materials or merchandise. Um, so generally, um, a weight restriction that's adopted just by the commission um, would not have the effect of um, prohibiting drop-off or pickup on the particular street affected. Um, because of that exception in that language. This actually proposes to amend the code section to add a new subsection that would be specific to these three streets and that would not include that exception as applying to those three streets. And Mr. Chair, I did have one follow-up question for Councilmember Rosenberg. Uh, I know what we are seeing on the screen today here in terms of proposed amendment language, I feel like you had some updated language. Did you want us to take action on this today? Or did you want to defer this and bring to us kind of the final recommended language from your, your side? Uh, thanks, Councilmember. Um, I, I, I would like either to uh, for you all to consider the amended language and if you have any different version of it that you'd like to see, I'd appreciate the commission's input on it. From my side, if I have the amendment letter language that I have, I would consider final. The caveat to that is what uh, I believe Mr. Gillen just asked. Um, I can't find the notes on that. So with regard to the Hutton Stone, um, I would commit to not moving any legislation forward that would negatively impact them. Uh, but but so, you do want the commission to take action today and not not defer again. I, I admit the will of the commission. I got you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If I may be sure. on that point, this is Teresa Castonis. May I be recognized? Yes, please. I, I just wanted to point out that if the commission does not act within thirty days of referral, then you kind of lose your opportunity to do so. So just keep that in mind in terms of a deferral. The, the, the council may proceed um, as though the commission, it doesn't specifically say that the council may proceed as though the commission has recommended it, but effectively they can because they are able to pass it by simple ma majority after the 30 days have expired if the commission takes no action on it. Would I have the option of bringing it back if I chose to, even if? Yes, of course you can always defer your own legislation. Okay. Thank you. Chairman Green, I have an, another yes. comment to bring up. Please. One thing to consider is there are, if, if Interstate 40 west or eastbound, if there's an accident that shuts down the interstate, there are two avenues to divert that traffic. Um, let's say that the, the crash or whatever blocks that interstate is between McCroy Lane and the Bellevue exit, Highway 70 exit. <clears throat> the two avenues to exit that interstate traffic is at McCrory Lane, and they can be sent down McCrory Lane to Highway 100 or over to Highway 70 uh, down McCrory Lane. It's the only way to evacuate that interstate, and that's going to include tractor trailers and, and vehicles of all sizes and all loads. Um, so the language uh, in excess of 31,500 pounds at any time on McCrory Lane um, we may want to look at that because there may be a time and an option where we don't have an option. We have to clear that interstate and provide a direction of travel for those large vehicles. And those, and it has happened many times in the past. And the only two options we have are to push them to Highway 100 and push them to Highway 70. If you take the, the longest journey, McCrory Lane to Highway 100, out of the, the equation and push everything to Highway 70, now you're doubling that commercial vehicle traffic on Highway 70, which is going to prolong the backup. And 
that is going to be predominantly up until they they get back to the interstate which would be a couple of th probably three to four miles that's predominantly residential farm and farm as well so that that's something to consider okay thank you that's a very good point um council member we, we one time considered a weight limit on a on another street and it and i think not all the players involved had had input yet and um it created some issues and i think you had mentioned there was still a business that needed to be contacted about this proposed language uh, Mr. Chair, I either need to find the email confirming that it's not or get you that confirmation a second time. Yeah. I just want to make sure because the last time we got subject to litigation. <laughs> <laughs> and this Costonis tells me I'm supposed to keep the commission out of litigation. <sighs> Strict like that. I can, I can elaborate on that a little bit also. You know, I'm Commissioner Gilgeland's good comment um, uh, did um, bring that up in my memory as well. And I, I think that you and I are very much on the same page. Um, uh, so um, I think that in that particular case, the issue was um, sort of the regulations of the Federal Highway Administration on the um, Surface Transportation Act. And, um, it did restrict local governments in some situations um, from um, uh, prohibiting truck traffic on most direct routes from um, the interstate system. And um, uh, it's possible that the exception for the 18 times per week um, would be insufficient to kind of um, distinguish this from that scenario. Um, although that is only for pickup and delivery. And so, um, uh, there were other things that they were concerned about in that um, that language, such as um, being able to get gas, um, you know, other um, sort of um, needs of um, the trucking industry as they're um, uh, driving along, access to um, like restaurants and bathrooms and gas and so forth. Um, and so um, I think that um, uh, it might be prudent to check on that maybe with um, uh, and the, the, the people who opined on that previously was um, the Tennessee Department of Transportation um, to make sure that they didn't perceive this as running afoul of those Federal Highway Act regulations. Um, so that that is a, a really good thought that to avoid our having um, uh, been um, uh, um, kind of deemed for that more than once by, by TDOT um, to kind of proactively approach them about it this time around. But I honestly didn't think about it until I heard this good discussion today. Okay. Well, thank you. Cause, Council Member Rosenberg, because what's to me very important is that the commission, this local, is that local authority still resides with this commission when in making these decisions. And, you know, what Ms. Costonis was discussing is, you know, there was a threat that, you know, that some of that local authority was going to be removed and um i know we all kind of like being able to have local authority and that's that's the uh, reason for my concern and uh to me it's better to make sure we have good legislation if it takes a little more time than to draft something in a rush so i, I hope that's helpful i'm trying to hopefully that's beneficial comments i hope uh it is thank you mr chair uh ms costonis yeah i mean i I don't want to preempt any further discussion about concerns because this is very helpful. Um, I think at the end of the conversation, what would be best would be uh, to ask you all not to take action for me to commit to bringing it back to traffic and parking before bringing it back to the council, despite the 30 day thing and try to get any uh, these concerns that have been brought up and any other ones that you all might have dealt with uh, with some mandatory language. I think that sounds like a great plan. Thank you very much. I think we've had a good discussion. Are there other council members? Ms. Kern, sorry. I just, I just had a quick one, and maybe this could be something you could bring back as well. Is I'm just, I would be interested in the practicality in terms of how this would be 
signed, um, particularly after the, you know, the immediate uh, news is gets out there. Um, like, would there be a special sign that would have to be developed for this kind of exception? And is that allowed or how would, um, I guess I, I'm just kind of interested in how it would actually be executed. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kern. My, my uh, presumption as somebody with no engineering, no engineer, engineering experience and zero days work to public works um, would be signage indicating the general weight limitation for through trucks. Um, the same way that they're signed elsewhere and that the limitation on local delivery would be a piece of our code that we do our best to publicize the same way we do um, noise enforcement and home business enforcement and that sort of thing, uh, as opposed to signage. Well, thank, thank you. So council member, um, just the next item on our agenda is the no trucks over 31,500 pounds on McCrory, Poplar Creek Road and Old Harding. Are we going to defer that as well okay. until you get this language squared away, please, sir? Yeah. I think that can be disposed of to go away on its own. However, okay. you all see fit to do that. Okay. I just want to be clear. All right. Sure. So I think we have a plan. You're going to come back to us with some, uh, clarification on the language and uh, really I, I, I think this is how better legislation gets made is the back and forth so yeah thank you all so much for your input your indulgence and I'll look forward to seeing you next month all right thank you very thank very you. Much. let me add councilman the contact yes. Derek and I if you need any language help or anything with your bill just just holler at us if you need any language support like Nora's question about the signs we'll help you with that Great. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciate Thank it. you. Okay. The next item, our deferred business. Uh, I think we need a motion on uh, item A to defer it again. If I could get a motion for an indefinite deferral. That'd okay. Be great. So moved. Okay. Right. And is there second. a second, please? Second, Gilliland. All right. All right. So let me do the roll. Uh, Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Okay. Commissioner Gilland. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. All right. So that's item has been deferred. Okay. Council Member Sledge, I see you're with us today. Yes, Chair. Thanks. Okay. Mike. You have uh one, two, three, four, five, six items. I think I can I can put you at a little ease. Um, okay. Item D, E, and F, I would be withdrawing. So, okay. Do you want to defer or withdraw? Uh, let's withdraw, actually. Okay. All right. So let's. Do we need a motion to withdraw those, uh, Miss Costones? Um, not the applicant is the one who is withdrawing it. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure we're, I'd like to keep, stay legal. <laughs> All right. We'll consider that. Okay. Council member Sledge, okay. well, you have B, you have B, C, and G still on the agenda, please. If it's all right, I do have a constituent who's attending on item okay. C if the commission finds it appropriate yes. to take that. Let's go, let's go to that one first, please, council member. Okay, great. Um, so this is the Rosedale and Herdwood appeal for an always stop. Um, this would be a, a three-way stop. Um, the appeal I wanted to, and I don't know if whoever's running the WebEx, um, I, I have a constituent who's, um, area code is is the 727 number it's miss patterson um if she's able if the commission would like to hear from her she actually brought this to me okay i'm here okay well why don't you speak miss is it patterson yes sir okay uh please oh. provide your comments Hey, Rosedale is a very busy avenue. It is a crossover from Bradsburg to Nolansville. Uh, there is a hill there that has hidden driveways, new construction, and the cars are, the speed limit, I believe, is 35, but they seem to think it's 45 and 50. 
There have been several, uh, like my daughter had uh, cars run through her yard. There's been a, a truck on somebody's steps. There's been animals hit, um, people almost being hit on the metro side, not on Berry Hill side, because we have sidewalks, but they do not on metro. And it's a very concerning thing. Without a stop sign, I'm afraid somebody is going to get severely injured or killed. Hello? Hey, thank you for your comments. Okay. Thank you. Um, Council Member Sledge. Uh, th thank you, Chair. And and I want to thank you all for, for listening on, on the constituent concerns here. Um, I, I share those concerns and Public Works, uh, I, I was copied last week when we were going through the um, the uh, you know traffic uh, calming measures and there was an application for Rosedale because it has become an increasing concern. Obviously, there are a lot of applications there, um, but I did want to make sure that folks knew that other residents have written, you know, in to petition and try to get traffic calming measures. In in the meantime, um, Rosedale is, as was described, it has been treated as a straight shot between Nolansville and Bransford. Um, there has been some infill development here over the last few years. And um, quite frankly, it, it is very appealing to folks to be, to come around and just kind of try to cut over as quickly as possible. Um, so I do believe that if we were able to establish a stop here, Herdwood residents, while there aren't a lot of residents, I'm sure the traffic counts very low, residents would be more confident in being able to pull out. And I would hope that it would um, mitigate some of the issues that um, constituents have brought up as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, public work staff, I'm sure you Y'all have comments? Derek Hagerty, Public Works. Uh, Corby, can you bring up the warrant analysis? Uh, so under Nashville Code Section 12.12.040, you know, all traffic control devices are intended to comply with the Federal Highway Administration's manual on uniform traffic control devices. Uh, so we use Section 2B.07 of that manual to determine whether or not always stops are warranted. Uh, what we're looking for are two, either one of two things. Um, the main use of a stop sign is for volume control. That's the first thing we look at. Um, what we've seen out here, and you know, as the council member mentioned, Herdwood, there's only about 30 residents back there. Um, you know, does not come close to meeting the demand for, for an always stop from a minor street. Uh, looking at the crash history going back three years, and we did pull these numbers two months ago, so they may be slightly out of date, but there was no MNPD reported crashes within the past three years at this location. Um, I know we mentioned occasionally, but stop signs are really not recommended for speed control. Um, most studies have shown once you're 150 feet past the stop sign, um, you're back up to the same speed or higher. So we uh, did not recommend an always stop at this location. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, commissioners, any questions? Commissioner, yeah, I've got a question, Lieutenant Gilliland. Um, is it possible to defer it until the next meeting? I know it's, it's already on the deferred business. And let's see if we can help with if if speeding is an issue out there if we can run um some operations out there with the motor units to see if and we'll go out there and do enforcement on rosedale and see if that helps at all i mean is is would that be an option Council Member Sledge, your thoughts? Uh, I, I'm, I'm at the, look, I, I will always welcome uh, speed control <laughs> of operations in the district. Um, I, I'm at the will of the commission on the deferral. Um, if, if it's believed that we can help mitigate these issues at least short term, I don't know. I mean, I don't know when determinations will be made by public works on the um, traffic calming applications for this most recent round. Um, but if that's what the commission would like to do is, is 
commit to that traffic and speed control for a month and then see kind of where things are, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. Mr. Haggerty? Mr. Haggerty? Yes. yes. Um, what kind of traffic calming, if it was implemented, would be recommended on a street like Rosedale? You know, we have our we have our tool of options uh, available. We always want these to be community driven. So I wouldn't make any recommendations before talking to the community and before being out on the street myself. But um, you know, if you go visit the traffic calming website, we have our toolbox there, and most of those would be in play. Thank you. Commissioners, any comments? I do wonder with this one, um, because the, the volumes are so low on the secondary, whether or not we could wait and see if um, it is selected through the traffic homing program. And then if not, bring it back up. Um, it seems like it would be one where traffic calling would make a lot more sense than a stop sign. But I also am certainly sympathetic to council member sledge concern that, it, you know, a stop sign might be better than nothing. All right. Jeremy Green, I'd like to make a motion that we defer it for 30 days and uh get some traffic enforcement out there on um on that street on rosedale and then see if that that helps any and then maybe they'll be further along in the application process for traffic calming okay so we have a motion for deferral second commissioner woods okay we have a second any further discussion okay all right uh Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown. I think we lost him. Aye. Right. Commissioner Gilland. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. Aye. Okay. So we're going to defer this, Council Member, and we're going to get some more enforcement out there for you. Okay. Great. I, I appreciate it, Yon. Thanks for the okay. suggestion. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, item B is appeal staff denial for an always stop at Kirkwood and Vox Lane there in Melrose. Council yeah. member? Yes, uh, so this one um, folks are probably familiar with. It's four-way four stop currently has stops for Vox, but none on Kirkwood. Kirkwood is an is a sort of similar drag in the sense that there is there is nothing bet stopping anyone between uh, essentially 10th Avenue or Leland and 8th Avenue, which is a long stretch. The, the thing that makes this one a little different, aside from being a four-way stop, is that we do have a funded um, sidewalk going from this intersection um, north on Vox um, for for quite a quite a distance and Public Works has been in um, progress of getting permission from uh, residents for that easement. Um, there is there's pretty heavy pedestrian traffic. It does lead to a a grocery store and other services. It leads to a Kroger over there. And I can tell you, I think there's a pretty strong um, just lived experience uh, argument for this one being an always stop as in addition to everything I mentioned, it also has a daycare at this corner. Um, and they have requested in the past some kind of traffic mitigation and it just has never come to fruition. So I'd, I'd request your support here. Thank you, council member. Uh, public work staff. Derek Hagerty, public works. Uh, I'll say my spiel of the ordinance and the MUTCD. So similar situation here. Uh, the major street, we're looking at 300 vehicles per hour over eight hours. Kirkwood does meet that threshold. For the minor street, we're looking at 200 vehicles, pedestrians, or bicyclists per hour. Uh, with Vox, we're looking at about 70 per hour, you know, plus or minus, depending on the time of day. So not meeting that minor street warrant. 
trash history, we're looking at five correctable turns over crashes over a 12 month period. We typically take those to be anything that's reported as an angle crash. Um, did not meet that threshold. We did see seven angle crashes in the past three years. So not warranted by METCD standards, uh, which is why we did not recommend the always stop. Thank you. Any comments from commissioners? I'd like to move to approve. All right, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a first and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, we'll take roll. We have a first and a second to approve the installation of an all-way stop. Council, uh, Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown. We've lost him, okay. Commissioner Gilman. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Commissioner O'Connell. I think we lost them. Okay. That's, uh, I think we're down to five members. Do I need to vote for a quorum? Commissioner O'Connell. Okay. I will vote yes so that we have five. Okay. The always stop has been approved, council member. Thank you, commissioners. All right. Item G, appeal staff denial for the installation of a handicapped parking space at 1010 Bait Avenue. Oh. Thank y'all um, for considering this appeal. So we've had a couple of these in this neighborhood in the, in the 12 South area um, over the last couple of years. These are residents who are, uh, as we like to use the term, aging in place, um, residents who have been there for a long time um, and whose needs have um, changed over the years. Uh, Ms. Russell over here has been in communication with me and I asked her if there was anything I could pass along to the commission. She is the owner of 1010 Bait. And she mentioned that she's having trouble um, with parking at her residence um, due to just, quite frankly, more people living there. Um, and she does she does have a disability that would qualify um, to for her to be able to park over here. Um, and then she has been concerned. She is able to walk, but she can't walk very far. And she mentions that she's concerned about having to walk distances during a certain time of the evening um, and at night. She does understand that a parking a, a disabled or handicapped parking space here is not exclusive to her, um, but it, it would help it would help her quality of life. Does she have a driveway in her residence? She it appears she does and I have gone by there. I have not gotten a, a sort of understanding of that. She also has a walkway to her porch the best I can understand is that it, it seems as though it may be easier for her to walk to her walkway than it is going to her driveway. Um, but I do not know that for sure. I, I, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that we've talked about that because we haven't. Yeah, it does appear that there is a driveway. Should we move to defer? Uh, do we need to follow up, Councilman? That's that. That would be fine if the commission wants to defer. I'll try to get that answered a little better. We have been in sporadic communication, and I'll try to okay. I'll try to get a firmer answer from All right. on that. So, uh, Miss Woods, would you like to make a motion, please? Yes, move to defer for um, one month, Councilman, or uh, whatever you all move to defer. 
one month is fine with me if it's fine. Okay. With is there a second? Commissioner, we have a second. Okay. We have a first and a second. All right, we'll take the roll. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Gilliland. Aye. Commission Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. Sorry, I had to step away for a second. That's okay. I get it. All right. Thank you. That has been deferred. All right. The next item on our agenda, and thank you, Council Member Sledge. Thank you. Okay. Uh, authorized no parking on the west side of Vine Court from Harding Pike to 200 feet, feet south of Harding Pike, requested by a resident. Mr. Chair, I repeat the deferral last month so I can clarify with the council person that she is okay with this. That has been confirmed. Um, because of the deferral, I couldn't put it on consent, but we're all in favor of this one. Okay. All right. So is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. All right. Is there a second? Second. All right. We have a first and a second. Council Member Williams. Aye. Council Member Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Gilliland. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Commissioner Green will vote yes, so we can have five. Okay, thank you. All right, the next item was Board and Commission's Ethics Training Metro Legal. Um, Chair, did we skip the two items up top, A and B? Uh, no, A, A was the third, and B, we approved. No, it's uh, under new, new business A and new business B. Oh, we yeah, so we never did discuss those, but Ms. Uh, Marshall was not around. Thank you, Ms. Kern. Did, we, did she ever come back? The ballet uh, zone? We're having technical difficulties, Mr. Chair. I would suggest that you check to see if there are any um, others in the audience that would like to speak on either of these. If not, um, I'm going to ask for a deferral on them okay. so I can get Ms. Marshall back uh, online. Is there anyone who'd like to speak about the ballet zone at 500 Broadway and the ballet zone at the Mumbrian Street? Okay. All right. Is there a motion to defer, please? Somebody. Second. All right. Take the roll. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Gilliland. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. I will vote to defer. So, okay. Now I think we got through. Thank you, Commissioner Kern, for keeping me on task. Okay. The Next item is ethics training. Uh, Mr. Green, I'll be the one presenting that. Okay, you thank you, Ms. Costonis. Please proceed. All right, thank you. Um, so um, this is something that the Mayor's um, Public Integrity Task Force um, has recommended that Metro Legal do. Um, which is to kind of give a little refresher presentation to all of our boards and commissions um, on various issues of ethics. Um, Corby, if you could go on to the next slide. We've, we're, we're trying to um, present um, five different goals in the course of this training. Um, one is to help you understand the benefits you can accept in your role as a commissioner. Um, two is to understand when you may be biased or have a conflict of interest and should recuse yourself. Three is um, to um, remind you to disclose knowledge that you've received from external sources about matters that um, are on the agenda. Um, and four is to articulate the specific reasons and basis for your decision. And the last one is um, Open Meetings Act, Act and Public Records Act. Um, so we will um, go through each of those. You can go on to the next slide, Corby. Oh, sorry, there's six. <laughs> I'm sorry, go back one if you don't mind, to the second slide. Yes. 
ethics and understanding best practices for making an informed decisions. Thank you. All right, um, then we'll go into the next slide. Okay, so the first goal is understanding the benefits you can and cannot accept related to your role on the board or on the commission rather. Um, so this is spelled out in um, Title II, um, uh, Chapter 222 of the Metropolitan Code. And basically um, within that chapter, um, there is um, uh, section 020 um, that kind of lists all of the things that are prohibited. And the, the um, category that this applies to is the category of employee. Employee is a defined term, and it's made clear that it includes members of Metro boards and commissions, even if they're volunteer and unpaid. Um, so this does apply to y'all. Um, so um, there are several things that employees shall not do um, under this section. And the first is that they may not accept or solicit any benefit that might reasonably tend to influence you to act improperly in the discharge of your official duties. You cannot use Metro property services or funds for personal purposes. You cannot use non-Metro, non-public Metro information for personal gain or for the gain of any family member or other employer. Go on to the next slide, Corby. Um, you shall not use a Metro um, position improperly to secure unwarranted privileges or exemptions for yourself, relatives, or others. You shall not accept other employment which might impair your independent judgment in the performance of your Metro duties. Um, and you shall not accept any benefit which the employee should reasonably believe, which which you as the employee would reasonably believe was intended to influence any action taken in your official capacity. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. There are some things, however, <clears throat> that you can accept um, if there's no conflict or appearance of conflict as a result of that. And the first of those is awards of trifling value publicly presented in recognition of public service, like a plaque or something like that. Gifts unrelated to a person's position as a Metro employee. So your friends and family members can still give you gifts because they love you. Um, meals, beverages, food, promotional items, or hand-produced items of a value of not more than $25 from a single source in a calendar year. And the last one is free or discounted admissions, tickets, or access to events or travel expenses from a sing single source in an aggregate value in a calendar year up to, up to $100. Or the other exception is um, tickets um, to um, a charity benefit um, that are more than uh, $100. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so there is um, the, that chapter 2222 two, two, two also has a section um, that creates um, a body to handle these issues, and that body is the Board of Ethical Conduct. Um, so it does two things. Um, uh, it hears complaints for violations of 2222020. Two, 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 oh, two, oh and it hears the shall nots that we just went over a, a minute ago. Um, and it also um, can um, issue advisory opinions. And, and one thing that's kind of nice is that um, uh, board and commission members, such as each of y'all, are um, entitled um, to request advisory commission, uh, opinions from this body if, if you need to or want to. We can go on to the next slide, Corby. Um, <clears throat> So as I stated, complaints, if, if complaints is made to a, a commission about a commissioner, it would go to this board of ethical conduct. Um, and what happens after such a complaint is made is that the um, attorney staff member in my office um, who staffs that board would investigate, evaluate, and make a report to the board regarding whether the facts, if proven true, would amount to an ethics violation. Um, and then based on that information, the board decides whether it would hold a hearing. Um, if a hearing is held and then the parties are given an opportunity to make their case. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. And um, there are also some potential penalties that could be um, uh, uh, issued by the Board of Ethical Conduct if there is a determination that a violation did occur, um, which is a request for resignation um, and where you know um, the infraction is so serious that it would amount to um, a criminal matter referral to the district attorney general for prosecution um, and um, uh, where there's some um, kind of um, 
legal damages to Metro that would be actionable, then you know there might be a referral to um, my department to pursue um, restitution in a civil case. Um, all of these, as you can imagine, are extremely unusual, um, but could theoretically occur. Um, please go on to the next. Um, okay. So we're, that, that covers the first item. Um, so this is the second item, understanding when you're biased or you may have a conflict and should recuse yourself. Um, so you have, as commissioners, the duty of independence. You are required to not act on your own self-interest or in, act on a bias in favor of people you know personally or against people you know personally. And um, you should not, um, you should be independent in that you should not act on the interests of um, the director or contract interests with whom your board interacts, the people who staff your board. Um, you must act in the best interest of the metropolitan government based on the law and the evidence that is presented to you. You can go on to the next slide. So he, here's the questions that we usually get is, in what circumstances should you actually recuse yourself from a vote? If you are biased against if you are biased based on a personal interest, and usually that's a personal financial interest, where you will gain or lose money fairly directly as a result of the decision. If you are biased or prejudiced or against a party uh, or uh, as an individual member of a group, um, in the example that we would give is if you are close friends or a business partner with one of the parties to the matter appearing before the decision. Um, and if you cannot fairly or impartially weigh the evidence because you have prejudged factual issues. Okay, move on to the next slide, please, Corby. Um, <clears throat> should you recuse, and that's some, you should not have to recuse yourself if you will not gain or lose money fairly directly from the decision. If you can be objective and do not believe your participation will create an appearance of impropriety. And where this is the case, you should nevertheless disclose your potential conflict, but state for the record that you believe you can be unbiased and will participate. Um, if you're not sure where your conflict um, falls within the, the yes or no category, please contact me or you know Chip and the rest of the public works staff to the Traffic and Parking Commission, and we will help you you know walk through it and um, try to make that judgment call. Um, yeah, moving on. Um, so now that takes us up to the third goal, which is disclosure. Um, so sometimes this is something that's sometimes not very well understood. Um, but um, in order to maintain that impartiality, it's really important to disclose the sources of information that you're receiving about a matter that comes before commissioners. And um, if that comes outside of the context of the open meeting itself, like if somebody contacts you before the meeting occurs, um, you should disclose that. Um, and that can include attempts to lobby you um, to take a particular position on a matter on an upcoming agenda. Um, and um, it can also be um, where you have personal knowledge from your own ex expertise or experience um, about an issue or an area of town um, that is um, uh, related to a matter um, uh, that is before you on the agenda. Um, so um, that is something that I think everybody's always so good about disclosing, but that, that you should indeed disclose as well. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, okay, so our, our fourth um, goal um, for this training um, was to encourage you to remember to articulate the specific reasons and bases for your decisions. Um, so um, this has more to do with whether your decision will be able to be upheld on appeal. Um, and in order for your decision to be upheld in appeal, the kinds of things that you should articulate in your um, uh, decisions and in the deliberation leading up to your decisions um, are based on the criteria in the relevant guidelines or laws, based on facts presented at the meeting, like testimony, documents, any evidence that's submitted. Um, past experience with similar issues, let me distinguish that. That doesn't mean like the um, personal knowledge that we were just talking about on the last slide. That means more like, um, the commission's past experience with similar issues. Like if you would be thinking about um, 
uh, exactly how the commission ruled in a very similar case you had last month. You want to kind of try to be consistent and think about, okay, that's the same, we should rule the same way, or if it's not the same, then ex explain why it's distinguishable. Um, and then studies by experts or specific observations made by the public. Okay. And th so those are all acceptable. The unacceptable reason would be um, sympathy for the applicant or for people who are opposed to the approval or opposition that is unrelated to the relevant guidelines for laws. So generally with this commission, um, what you are tasked with is, you know, public safety and uh, the flow of traffic on the streets. Um, so, if, you know, if something is brought up that has nothing to do with that, then that might be inappropriate. Goal five, understand that the Open Meetings Act prohibits deliberation outside of board meetings and Public Records Act makes almost all your emails open to the public. When we say all your emails, of course, all your emails about Metro business, not all of your emails about your personal business. But um, board members should absolutely avoid the use of emails to discuss board issues or invite comments from other members con concerning any public business. Unfortunately, this is a type of violation that occurs very often, and I think it occurs very inadvertently. But the Open Meetings Act is very clear that electronic deliberation is prohibited, and case law has interpreted electronic deliberation to include email discussion um, between members of a commission um, about a substantive matter that may appear before them for deliberation or decision. Um, so you should not do that. Um, um, one tip I actually have more for staff um, to avoid that because it is so easy, I think, when you get a group email to just kind of instinctively hammer out a reply and hit reply to all, um, that um, I, I always recommend to staff to um, uh, just BCC the commission members in your emails to the whole group um, and put yourself in the two box. And that way, if somebody inadvertently hits reply to all, it won't actually go to all the other commissioners. And that's a good way to avoid that inadvertent electronic deliberation. Um, the next one is it does not matter whether the email is a metro email address or a private email address. And that's correct in terms of whether something is a, pro excuse me, a public record, um, even if you're using a, a personal email um, on, and not a metro issued email, um, it can still be a public record if it meets the definition of a public record, which means it pertains to metro business. Um, and violations of the Open Meetings Act make decisions based upon these deliberations void. So this has actually happened. Um, uh, basically, if you were to engage in electronic deliberation or some other improper deliberation outside of an open meeting context and, and took any subsequent vote on that matter and it were to be discovered that you had done that, um, a court could look at that and, and void the action that you took on that vote. Um, and so the correction for that would, it would probably be remanded to the commission and you would have to kind of um, uh, like reconstruct or reconduct the deliberation on that matter um, before you can take action on it. So um, going on to the next slide, one um, uh, issue is um, it's for the purposes of the application of the Open Meetings Act. What does it mean to have a meeting? This is a defined term in the statute. And it means when two or more members of a governing body with the authority to make decisions for or recommendations to a public body meet and make a decision or deliberate toward a decision. So the important thing to remember is when something does make that meet that definition of a meeting, then you have to send out public notice of it beforehand. Um, and the purpose of the public notice is to let people know that that matter will be on that agenda. So if they are interested in it, they will have reasonable notice um, to um, come to that meeting or um, attend it virtually as we are doing currently. Um, in some cases where it's a public hearing, they actually have an opportunity to speak at it. Um, usually that is the case with the Traffic and Parking Commission, um, but a lot of times it's not necessarily. They may just have a right to attend rather than a right to speak. Um, an adequate public notice has been determined by um, case law um, to mean sufficient notice under the circumstances that would fairly inform the public of the meeting. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. Okay. So there are also some things that are considered as falling outside of the definition of a meeting. 
So those would be an on-site inspection, a chance meeting, or informal assemblage. I have no idea what an informal assemblage is, but I love the word. Um, or an attorney-client meeting. Now, an attorney-client meeting, I think we've done these. They're called executive sessions. And they are um, kind of a, they have to be a one-sided presentation by the attorney to the commission um, about a matter that is either currently in litigation where the commission is a party or where there's a pending controversy involving the commission that's likely to lead to litigation. Um, and in those cases, we would have an executive session that would be non-public um, in which I or other attorneys in my office could give you advice um, and kind of um, uh, impart a perspective to you or some liability um, that would be confidential under relevant privileges and um, uh, that would enable you to make an informed decision um, and, and, and have that the benefit of that confidential information in your decision making. But then the actual deliberation and vote on that matter would still have to occur in a public open meeting process. Okay, we can go on to the next one. Okay, and our last goal was to understand best practices for making informed decisions. Um, so best practices for staff, which I think our staff does for the commission, is to provide a detailed agenda for each meeting, ideally at least a week ahead of the meeting so that the public may be informed of issues to be deliberated or decided. Um, the board may review relevant documents or contracts in preparation for the meeting, provide a staff report or recommendation for each agenda item in written or oral form with the reasoning for that recommendation, and start each meeting with a declaration by any board members of conflicts or refusals on agenda items. And I, let me just highlight that last bullet point because I think um, sometimes we get um, caught up and um, it's common for someone to not mention that they're recusing themselves until all of the discussion on a matter has practically speaking occurred. And that's not a best practice. The best practice is to say upfront before a matter is discussed, um, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, could I please be recognized as um, uh, recusing myself on um, matter 5B on the agenda as I have a conflict of interest, you know, to kind of get get that taken care of at the front end so that it's, it's clear to everyone that you will not participate in that discussion, not just that you will not participate in that vote. Okay, moving on to the next one. Um, uh, making sure that you understand that the work of the department um, staffing your board um, so that would really be something for new board members who really um, haven't um, uh, worked at the on the commission previously. You know, just on the, that front end, you would want to make sure you're familiar with what your role will be. Um, then, you know, to be prepared for each meeting, review the agenda, review the relevant documents, um, be prepared to ask questions um, in the in the meeting, um, and you know, become aware on the front end, like we just talked about, about anything that you need to disclose or anything that you need to recuse yourself from. And then finally, um, it says, considering adopting metrics for your board to measure whether you're acting timely or in accordance with your board's duties. Um, you usually act right away. You know, sometimes there are boards and commissions that take things into consideration and need to order or issue a ruling within 15 days or something like that, but I think you would usually act right away. So I don't think that's that relevant to you. Next slide, please. And so that's it. So the blank there would be my name. Of course, you can always ask me to very fast on this question. Um, Laura Barkinthus Fox was the attorney in my office who prepared this presentation that, again, we're using for all of our boards and commissions to update on this. And I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you, as always, Teresa, for trying to keep us legal. Uh, we, we're very grateful. Uh, My pleasure, and it's not hard. <laughs> so we work hard at trying to stay legal. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I think that wraps up our uh, February 8th uh, meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? I will make a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. You are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. you.